This is the Ted Walshin Podcast. Brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. And Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And now, here's Ted Wallachian. My special guest this week is the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Radio and Television News Directors Association. His broadcast career includes work in both radio and television in Montreal, Halifax, and most recently in Toronto as senior anchor of City TV's City Pulse newscast. He did so since the station's inception until 2016. He has dedicated countless hours volunteering for numerous charities, most notably the Herbie Fund. Welcome, Gord Martineau. Good to see you. Thank you very much, Ted, for having me on. Good to see you, too. You're, you're Montreal born and raised, right? Right, Are you yes. a, a, a Habs fan? You know, this is the problem when, when, <laughs> public, when you're a public individual that you have to cheer for the hometown gang. And so uh, I, I adopted the Leafs as my team. But, I mean, I have yeah. a lengthy history of hockey in my family. And my father was a professional goaltender. My two really? cousins, Donnie and Gordy, uh, played for the Canadian team or the European. They won the European Cup in 1952 and got presented with the trophy by uh, Prince Philip. Uh, and Gordy later played for the Habs for a while in the early 50s for Sam Pollock. So, yeah, I love hockey and I love the Habs. I have actually a signed photograph of Guy Lafleur, Rocket Richard, and Jean Bellamy all wow. together. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, were you a, uh, an Expos fan when the Expos landed at Jury Park? I was. I remember uh, going to, to uh, the Olympic Stadium when the Expos were playing and the Cincinnati Reds were in town. And so uh, the, the guy doing sports, Ron Roosh was his name, he took me, he said, you want to go to the game? And I said, sure. He said, it'll be great because Cincinnati Reds are in town. And, and I knew I knew about Joe Morgan, George Foster, Johnny Bench, you know, this mm-hmm. big star. But it was the first game that Tom Seaver pitched for the Reds after leaving. Uh, was it the Mets he played for? Yeah. I think so. Tom. Yeah. And so that was a big thrill for me. So, yeah. So I love it. Uh, you know, I used to used to be able to climb over the fence at uh, CFCF, CTV station in Montreal. This was right next door to Jerry Park, and you could watch the Expos for free. Yeah. Now, let's, let's talk about your, your, youth, your, your youth in Montreal. When you were a, a student in, let's say, high school, or even yeah. prior to that, did you ever have aspirations of working in radio and television? Was that something that you dreamt of doing? I knew what I wanted to do when I was 14. And... When I was 14 years old, there was no doubt in my mind I wanted to be in radio. Yeah. And, because, and for the simple reason, the narrow-minded, self-important reason, that that's where the money was, and that's where the girls, I could meet girls doing that, and I could buy a, a, a cool car. That was my, my motivation. I don't think you're the first person or the last person to enter that, uh, that realm for that reason. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I quickly learned uh, when after I did an audition for a station in uh, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, that uh, information was where it's at. Information is king. Yeah. And so I forgot about being a rock jock and worked in the newsroom and, and labored for three years and finding out what news was, what it was all about, and the, the, the key tenets of journalism. And how old were you exactly, Gord, when, when you gave birth to that voice? <laughs> um, it, 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 just, it just happened, uh, I guess, when I hit puberty. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, you were probably like six and all of a sudden you sounded, you're sounding like you're 35, right? Good morning, <laughs> got, Mother. Yeah. Alphabets <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I used to do when my mother came home from work is, uh, as she was making dinner, because that's what she did, she worked all day and then came home and made dinner for, for us. Uh, there were five of us, and uh, I used to tell her the events of the day, what had happened. Really? And I don't know why I, I did that. I just did that when I was in high school. And so that was kind of a, an early inkling that information was important to everyone. Yeah. Now, you started off in radio? Yes. In Halifax? Yes. At what station? CFDR, which is no longer on the air. Mm. Three that I worked for. Are no longer on the air. They're, they're all AM stations, and 
that maybe there's there's a message there or something. I don't yeah. know, but yeah, it was CFDR, and it was uh, it was geezer music, Ted. Yeah, you know, easy listening. Uh huh. Uh huh. And you know, all I wanted to do is listen to rock and roll music. You know, yeah. so that was a little frustrating for me. But so what? I, I had a job, and I was glad to have it. And how old were you when you got that job? Nineteen. Nineteen. Yep. And you know, I didn't know at that point in my life. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I sent out audition tapes, okay? So, and, and you, you'll know this. When I did the audition tapes, I did it on a half-track machine. And when you use a half-track machine, if you make a mistake and go back and record over it, you end up with two voices. And so I made a million mistakes, and, and there were a million tracks on the tape. Sent it out to a number of radio stations, never got an answer. And I'd gone to, uh, I worked at the Douglas Hospital uh, over that summer. Douglas Hospital was uh, uh, an institution for people with psychological challenges. And I used to make baby food. There were a lot of children in there. And I made baby food in the cafeteria. That was my job over the summer. And then a friend of mine said, uh, at the end of the summer, why don't we go to Detroit and see what happened in the riots? And, okay. So I went to Detroit. We spent a couple of days there. When I came home, there was a message from uh, the manager of a radio station in Halifax who said, well, we're holding auditions. If you want to come down, great. If you don't, that's that's up to you. But, but you know, here's the radio station, and they gave me the address, and that was it. Over that summer, uh, I had saved. I think I had ninety five dollars in the bank, and so I bought a ticket to uh, an airline ticket from Air Canada to go to Halifax and to do the audition, and never came back. How long did you stay there? Three years. And did you? Is that where you transitioned from radio to television in Halifax? No, the transition came. What happened was I'd left CFDR, and I wanted to come back to Montreal. I missed my friends, yeah. missed my town, my family, all that. And so I auditioned and got a job at, at CJAD, which was the standard broadcast. Sure. Country. And so I did late night news uh, there for a year and re realized that, you know, the only way to move ahead in this business is if somebody dies <laughs> at, at CJAD because they were all lifers there. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to be doing this these hours forever. So I went back to Halifax and uh, got a job at CJCH, which was um, a chum-owned radio station. And they also had a television station, which was a CTV affiliate. Mm -hmm. And one afternoon, nobody wanted to do the news on CJCH television. They were all, you know, diehard radio people, and they didn't care about television. They thought television was fluff. So the guys came to me and said, um, hey, uh, kid. Uh, you want to do this uh, five-minute newscast at one o'clock? I said, uh, okay. Well, you have to write it and do everything, but it's all yours if you want it. I went, oh, okay. So, and he said, that'll be in addition to what you're doing now on radio. So I did it, and I thought, I, I liked it. And I thought, okay, I, I, at some point in my life, I'm going to trans transition to television. And it happened when I went back to Montreal, but that's, you know, uh, that's a longer story. Are you okay with me continuing that? <laughs> yes, of course. So you okay. go back to Montreal and, and you start working for CFCF television. Yes. I, no, I, w I went to CKGM, which was, did you know CKGM and Jeff Stern? Yeah, yeah, State? yeah, for sure. I worked at Seafox okay. in Montreal back in the, oh, in, in 76. Oh. All right. On, All the, right. on the island. Yeah, that was after. I, I worked at uh, CKGM in 1970. Uh -huh. I, actually, 1971, sorry. And uh, so I got a job there doing uh, afternoon and weekends. And then uh, they uh, wanted me to do the morning drive. So I did news uh, from, you know, from 6 in the morning until 11 in the morning. And, and uh, that was my job for a year. Then I read in the newspaper one Sunday that a guy named Daryl, what the hell was his name? Daryl Jans. He was doing the weekend news on CFCF television. And he was leaving to move to Calgary. And I thought, well, if they're not going to call me. I'm going to call them. So I did. And... Uh, Bert Canis was the news director, and he was like, uh, you know, like uh, Mr. White in the uh, Spider-Man movies or Superman movies, yeah, yeah. you know, he, he rolled up a cigar sticking out of his mouth. Yep. He was a real hard-nosed guy, and, and so he said, yeah, yeah, you, you can do the audition. So, okay, uh -huh. I went over to the audition, and they made the horrible mistake of handing me the script 15 minutes before they recorded it, because I looked at it, and I went, is this it? I went, oh, this is this is easy because I, I, I'm very lucky. I'm a quick study. When I see something, I can remember it. And when I see script, I remember it. 
And so I just read it through, and they came in and said, are you ready? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. So I did it, and afterwards they were shaking their heads a little bit because I delivered the whole thing to camera. There was no such thing as a teleprompter in those days. So the, they said, did you memorize that? I said, yes. And they said, in 15 minutes? I said, well, actually, well, less than 15 minutes. It yeah. was pretty easy. And so I got hired. You know, that that's quite amazing. And, and I'll, I'll, share, I'll share a story with you, but I'm not going to tell you the person's name. But he's fairly well known, uh, who, who worked in years and years in television, national television, yeah, and came yeah. to to work to do to do some radio, uh, okay. and he couldn't do an interview on the radio unless the questions were pre written for him. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I've heard stories about people in our business, Ted, that really surprised me. Uh, that you know, some would almost get get sick. You know, um, some people that that I knew in in broadcasting would almost get sick before they went on the air. They were so uptight. Uh-huh. You know, if if that's a problem, you might might want to consider a different career. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. You know, I know people that just have no aptitude whatsoever for being on air, other than they got a face and a voice. Yeah, and that was, you know, there, there basically wasn't a big IQ growing. There. And of course, now if you want to be on television, you need to have a face and a voice, and and be ready to accept twenty eight thousand dollars because uh, they're getting rid of the guy who's had the fifteen years experience before you because we're they're paying him too much. That's another story. We'll get into that later on in the show. Yeah, that is a story. Yeah. Yes, it is. So, so you're you're off finally to Toronto, where you yep. where you work for you work for three three different stations in in Toronto. I mean, if you work for CFTO, which is now CTV Toronto, you work for yep. Global, and of course, um, most famously for for City TV. You, yep. were, you you came first to CFTO. Yes, uh, that was in 1974. Uh, I was sitting at my desk at CFCF in Montreal at the time, and uh, got a phone call. Um, you, would you like to audition for Nightbeat News at CFTO in Toronto? Mm-hmm. And I went, uh, at that time, I didn't want to leave Montreal because I had an audio production business and things were going okay. And I just thought, well, why would I want to leave that? And then I thought, okay, well, you know, if you've made the decision that television news is where it's at for you, then you have to follow through. And so I did. I, I came to Toronto and did the audition and went home and just booted it all over the place. I thought I did a horrible job. And uh, came back to Montreal, and I thought, well, that's that. So a few days later, I got a call from Ted Steubing, the news director, who said, uh, okay, you're on. Uh, we want you to come, you know, to uh, to Toronto. And then there was the issue of salary. And I sat at my desk, and that day, that very day, I had received my T4 slip, so I knew exactly how much I made the year before, and it was $18,000. And I thought, well, um, I'm going to need an increase. So I said, uh, Twenty-two thousand, and they said, "No, there's no way. We will. We wouldn't pay that kind of money." And I said, "Oh well, I'm sorry. That's that's my number." And the guy says, "Well, just hold on the phone for a second. I'll go and talk to my my manager, my boss, whatever it was." And so he came back and he said, "Okay, you're on." And that was it. I, I came to Toronto, and that was uh, March twenty fifth, I think, nineteen seventy four. Mm-hmm. And how long? And I was there for three years. For three years. The, la- the last thing I did. At CFTO, they they were relying on me more and more for live television. It was I anchored their election broadcast, and that that was the last one. I, it was June of seventy seven, and uh, Bill Davis won a minority re-election, and uh, so that that was the last thing I did. And then came back to Montreal to CFCF because the main anchor on the six o'clock show had gone to CBC, and they wanted me to come back. And I said, well, there's no way I'm coming back. I'm staying here in Toronto. And they offered me fifty-eight thousand dollars. Wow! Making what twenty-four at the time, and I thought, uh, "Gee, <laughs> that's a lot of money." I knew the job, and uh, okay, so I, I did. I went back, but I quickly knew it only took a few months to realize that it was the wrong move professionally. And so I said to them, "You know, I, I can't be here anymore." And they, they almost fell on the floor, and they said, "Well, wait, we have this." station in Toronto. So CFCF at the time was owned by a group called Multiple Access, and it was really one of the first high-tech businesses in Canada. And they owned a big share of City TV in Toronto. We want you to move there. 
And I went, are you insane? <laughs> Nobody in their right mind would work at City TV. The place was a madhouse. <laughs> you know, they had a few wacky shows on the air, like, like, um, like uh, who's the guy who runs the, uh, they have fist fights in the middle of these, these shows, you know? And I said, there's no, I'm not doing that. So they said, well, just hold on. Here's what we're going to do. And they sat me down and, and told me exactly what was going to happen. They were remodeling the building, uh, renovating. They didn't have a newsroom at the time. It was at 99 Queen East. And, uh, you know, we're going to take the, the thing apart. And we want you to meet Moses Neimer. I said, why do I want to meet him? Well, he's the president. He's calling the shots. Okay. So I wake up one morning in Montreal, fly to New York to meet Moses at the Pierre Hotel in New York on the uh, patio. And he wants to give me the song, chapter and verse, what's going to happen at City TV. And I thought it was a great concept. And uh, he's obviously a very smart guy, a little bit wingy, but he's a smart guy. So I agreed that local news is where it's at. Because at the end of the day, your primary concerns in anyone's life are your job, your house, your family. Mm -hmm. They're all local concerns. You know, at some point, you will, your interest will gravitate to national and international events, but local is where it's at. And so that was going to be the focus of City TV. And the newscast, the tagline was going to be a day in the life of Toronto. And that's what happened. So I moved to City TV at 99 Queen Street East, and I was there for 39 years at City. But at one point, you left and you went across town over to a global television. Right. Did you have a bit of an argument with Mr. Snymer? No, my contract was up and I didn't like the money they were offering. And I thought I was worth more. I thought my relative value to City TV was more than what they were offering. And so I left and went to uh, to Global. And uh, David Mintz was the president of the station and he signed me up. And I was there for 11 days <laughs> and it was a disaster. They had three news directors. When was the last time you heard of any station having three news never directors. never and they were all crazy <laughs> and i mean crazy the first night i was on the air <laughs> they took me to george bigliardi's to celebrate the, the first night that's a well-known steakhouse in toronto for those who don't know yeah 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 great restaurant so and it was dinner time and it was the place was jammed and they were pounding and i mean pounding martinis and so they all the three of them were just hammered and, and when they wanted to make a point, they had to stand up and point their finger at me. And so <laughs> they were doing this, and there was no, uh, let's say, there was no um, hesitancy to use the most foul first words you've ever heard. Right. And so the people in the restaurant are turning around looking at, what the hell is this? And I thought to myself, oh, no, what have I gotten into here? And they were all crazy. And what they did was they hired Suzanne Perry. You know Matthew Perry from Friends? Sure, his mother. His mother. Who worked for, was, for, for Pierre Trudeau, right? She was his press secretary. Right. Yes. And she was one of two press secretaries I'd worked for that were uh, associated with Trudeau. But anyway, they hired her. She had no experience in the business. None. Bill Cunningham hired her. And they fired him because he hired her. <laughs> anyway. They, she, uh, you know, if, if you're a woman and you're in the south of France on a beach and you're wearing a the top of your bathing suit, you look completely out of place. They just have a more mature view about these things. So some uh, some insect took a picture of her and sold it to a magazine, and they put it on their cover, right. one of these magazines. And so there was much controversy about her before I even got there. But anyway, um, so I was on there for 11 days. I knew it was a disaster, and I, and I resigned. I hadn't even signed the contract yet. And I, and I told them I'm leaving. And they threatened to sue me for half a million dollars. And I didn't have anywhere to go at the time. But Alan Waters called me, the president, of, the owner of Chum, and said, look, we'll, we'll back you up if they sue you. And we want you to come back to City TV. And, and, you know, we worked out a deal, and that's what I did. Because at that point now, Alan Waters, the Chum, the Chum group, had purchased City TV. Yes. Right. So when he... When he fully came on the picture at City, we knew that we had the money to do the things we wanted to do. And as you know, in television, ideas are great, but they're very expensive yeah. to put in practice on a daily basis. But once that money came through, uh, there was no stopping uh, City, City News, City TV, City Pulse, 
and uh, you know all of the all of the great programming that city became involved in, you know, like fashion television, much music, the new music, all of those things mm. came out of the newsroom because the place was an idea factory. It was the most exciting place I've ever worked for, and it because you went to work every day not knowing what was going to happen. You know, in in broadcasting, if you have an idea um, these days, anyway, you're told to get lost. We're, we're busy. But at City, it was, okay, tell me more. And then it was, okay, go out and shoot it. I want to see what it looks like. And that's when all the great ideas and creativity uh, became a, a big hit at City TV. And so the place was just fun. You went to work every day. Except, I don't know how many people get out of bed in the morning or, or got out of bed in the morning at that time and went, great, I'm going to work today. Yeah. Because it was, a, it was a thrill to go to work every day at City TV. Gord Martin was my special guest. As you look back on your, on your career in both radio and television, the most influential people in your lives, Alan Waters, you say, is, would, would have been one of them for sure? And Ted Rogers. And Ted Rogers. I, I was asked to speak at both, to MC, if you will, uh, both memorials. And both were incredibly intelligent people, but also extremely grounded, you know, Alan Waters, you may remember this, always had a pocket protector, you know, sort of ballpoint pens around it, yeah. and, and a plastic pocket protector, and a brush cut, and never forgot the names of people who worked for him. He was the sweetest man you've ever met in your life, and so was his wife, Marjorie. She baked chocolate chip cookies every year at Christmas for everybody at City TV. I mean, it was a big undertaking, you'd have to do that. She made them herself, yeah. and so these were wonderful people. Ted Rogers was the same way. And I'll tell you how City TV ended up in Dundas Square. When City TV uh, was sold by the Sons, after Alan Waters had passed away, they sold City TV and everything at Chum to CTV. The public broadcasting regulator, uh, the CRTC, Canadian Radio Television Commission, said to CTV, you can have everything, but you can't have City TV because that would give you uh, an undue amount of influence over news coverage. Right. So, Ted Rogers stepped in and bought City TV, much to the chagrin of many people who worked with him. Uh, and that's another story, which I'll elaborate on later. But he came into the newsroom one day. We had actually had to share our newsroom with the thing that we created, which was CP24. We, we created that monster. And for some reason, Ted Rogers let it slip through his hands and didn't include it with City News. So anyway, um, he came into the station one day and said, okay, well, we have to move. Does anyone have any ideas? And I knew uh, I, was a, I was and still am an avid cyclist. And so I used to cycle downtown all the time. And I knew that building at 33 Dundas Square was empty. It had been purchased by the Olympic Spirit Group. And for the reason that they could demonstrate certain Olympic activities, which athletes had to perform in order to win medals. And they also had a restaurant in it. But I guess there was a, a lack of interest in it because it folded not long after it began. And so the building lay empty for, I think, about a year and a half. And so I did some investigating. And I phoned Ted Rogers on a Thursday afternoon. And I said, Ted, uh, I'm sorry to lay this on you like this, but I have an idea of where we should be. And it's in Dundas Square. The building is owned by the Olympic Spirit Group out of Geneva. Uh, and I also know that Google is going to sign an offer to, to, to buy the building and sublet a couple of floors. So if you want to make a move, you know, you have to do it now because Google is going to sign the paperwork next Tuesday. And so he had what, you know, just a few days to figure it out. And he put down the phone, got in the car with Loretta, his wife, drove down, looked at the building and wrote the check. Hmm. And, and I was flabbergasted. I didn't. I didn't think that you know I had any influence or or that he took any uh, interest in, in my idea, but he did. He bought the building, and uh, the rest is history. That's where it is now. You've interviewed um, and spoken with all kinds of mayors, premiers, prime ministers. Yeah. Any of them stick out in your mind that you either did get didn't get along with or really got along with well? Pierre Trudeau. Jean Chrétien and Stephen Harper as prime ministers. And I like single one of them because they were nice people. Never mind their politics. I like them because of the people they were. And and, and, and in Chrétien and Harper's case, the people they are. Yeah. You know, 
totally meant it, had, had the best interests of the country at heart, and the policies you may not have agreed with, but they were good people. Yeah. I really liked them. And, and, uh, and you got along well with all three of them. Yes, yeah. I did. I, I, you, you and I ran into each other at, at Prime Minister Trudeau's funeral in Montreal. Yes, we did, and that was hilarious for, for a number of reasons. One of them being, it was, uh, let's say, a very unusual situation because all the media were sectioned off into one area. We were roped, and there were about 100 of us. And <clears throat> when you're doing live broadcasting, you have to be in touch with the control room constantly. So whenever a cell phone would ring, 100 people would instantly <laughs> Put it to their ears. So it was always like a Woody Allen movie, you know. It was very comical, but uh, yeah, that was uh, that was quite an event, you know. You well, I think what somebody. what really took people aback was, you know, actually seeing Fidel Castro in person. Yeah, yes, that surprised a lot you of know. people. We couldn't believe he showed up, and I guess, and I got a story about Castro that I'll tell you. But um, I guess the expectation was, of, whoa. The Americans were really surprised. Well, he's a communist. You know, what's he doing at Trudeau's funeral? And so Trudeau, uh, you know, what I liked about him is he was thumb his nose at convention, yeah. which is one of the reasons I went to City TV. But he, I mean, he dated Barbara Streisand, Leona Boyd. Sure. I mean, he was a cool guy. He was cool. But you know, and but the expression, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. And I had this conversation with, with, with a colleague of yours, uh, Peter Mansbridge. Uh, about a year yeah. or so ago, and I said, in this case, the apple fell out of a tree, bounced into a truck, and kept driving until it reached a fino. <laughs> That's a funny way of putting it. Yes. They're not really alike at all, are they? Not at all. They are polar opposites. Um, the, the current prime minister has none of the cool that his father did, uh, none of the high IQ his father did, in my estimation, and none of the, what can I say, savoir yeah. faire. He just doesn't have it. And, you know, it, it's a shame because, you know, I, I really dislike what he's doing to the country for a variety of reasons. That some of his policies just don't make any sense at all. And, you know, what can I say? Uh, they are polar opposites. Pierre Trudeau was a cool guy, very smart man, Rhodes Scholar, all of that, you know. Uh, and his son is not. And what did you see in Stephen Harper? Because a lot of people, they look at Stephen Harper and they think that this guy is is is, is as stiff as the cardboard in, in your shirt from the from the dry cleaner. Well, that was that was the image. I think he cultivated that. Yeah, I think he may have. You're right. He he was very aware of his image, and uh, but I got an exclusive with him the day before the election uh, when he won, and. I just said to myself, he was, you know, in a minority position. And I said to myself, what is it about this guy? Because we spoke casually. It's, I interviewed him a couple of times. But the day before the election, um, he agreed to do a one-on-one. -on -one. So I did. And I said to my producer when we left, I said, this guy's going to win the election big time tomorrow. And she said, what? I said, yeah. He gives every indication that he knows what the outcome is going to be. I guess he had polling done. And the polling suggested that he was going to have a majority, or he was going to win a majority. And when I signed on that night on the election broadcast, I said to my uh, producer, another one who was handling the, the broadcast, I said, five minutes into the broadcast, I said, declare a Harper majority. He said, are you insane? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. Stephen Harper gave me every indication that he was going to win big. He had a smile that was, you know, he did, did smile very often. But it was a, you know, a cheek splitting grin that, that just yeah. wouldn't stop. And so, and I was right. We were the first to declare a major, Harper majority. He's an interesting man. I like him because I felt he was a real person. And, and you get that from him. I don't think uh, Justin Trudeau is a real person. There's something missing. He, he comes across like he's, he's still teaching his acting class. The drama teacher. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you get that from yeah. him, you know? And, and I don't understand. He seems to be, you know, and, and you you get this elitist uh, vibe from him, especially when he's traveling. I mean, you know, he's he's singing in the piano lounge uh, at a hotel at the, when the Queen died. You know, what I mean, as he's attending the funeral. Yeah. I mean, just he, things that just don't make any While sense. While he's staying in a six thousand dollar a night room. 
seven thousand, yeah, which yeah. you wouldn't admit, which you won't yeah. admit to. No, and and the money uh, that is spent on his private jets going here, there, yeah. and everywhere, which is completely unnecessary. Now, uh, do, 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 do you think if you had an opportunity to to interview today uh, Jean Chrétien, and if you asked him what he thought of, not that I want to make this a Justin Trudeau bash fest, but what would he yeah. think? Oh, I think he would be very yeah. happy. Um, and, you know, but I think in true Chrétien fashion, he wouldn't say yeah. much. But you would get an indication from his, the, the way he responds to questions, but what his true feelings were, because he's a classy guy too, a great chap. You know, he's he's a, a you know a typical Quebecois, nice person, totally grounded, manners, moral yeah. fiber, moral comfort, you know, all of that. Do you see anybody in the f- in, in the future federally that that, that that's going to have become one of those great statesmen, states people? No. I, d- I don't. Uh, you know, be- partly because I haven't spoken to any of them or, or, or observed them. Uh, yeah. you know, microscopically like you do when you're, when you're working, you know, I had to throw off that yoke and, and just not do that anymore, which was a huge transition. As Bill Blair said to me once, when we talked about retirement, uh, because he was retiring as well, he said, it's like running at a hundred miles an hour with your hair on fire. And then all of a sudden everything stops, <laughs> you know, it, the transition to private life is wow. It's a monster transition. And, and, and for me it was very difficult to do. I'm over it now, but it was really tough for me to do because it was my yeah. life. I loved the job. You know, it, it was never a job for me, ever. I never had one day at, at City TV when I thought, I don't want to be here. Never. And I, I, how lucky am I? So the, the, the question is, in the minds of many people, is, and this happens so often now in the media, in radio and television and in print, and this is so common in, in the last half decade to decade, is did they go on their own or were they pushed? Like nobody asked whether Wally Crowder was pushed out of his chair because everybody knows that he wasn't, that you wouldn't boot him out of his chair. Was Gordon Martineau booted out of his chair? Yeah. Good, so was I. <laughs> Well, I, I never would have left of my own accord. I would have in time yeah. because I said, oh, the day this job isn't fun anymore, I'm going to bail. Always interesting. And I work with some incredible people. Yeah. You know, that, like I said, how lucky am I? I'm the luckiest guy in the world, in my estimation, to have had that job for as long as I did and to have worked with the people I did because mm-hmm. every single one of them was a 100% pure human being. Did you see it coming? Yes. You normally yeah. do, don't you? Yeah, yeah. When uh, Rogers was making some moves in, in terms of management, and you could, the writing was on the wall, I knew it was coming, and I was not happy about it. But uh, you know, what could I do? Um, I, I was never going to let it influence my presentation or the, the way I acted publicly. It was never going to be that way because um, my lawyer, Michael Levine, everyone knows Michael Levine. Sure. Uh, he said to me. If you go out on a bad note, uh, it will hang over your head forever. So don't do that. Yeah. And I agreed. So, and that's what I did. I just, you know, they wanted to have the big party for me. And I said, no, thank you. Uh, because, you know, in, in my in my opinion, there's nothing phonier than feigned sincerity. Yeah. And that's going to be. And I didn't want any part of it. And I just said, you know, thank you very much. Um, I've had a, a great run, 39 years. And uh, goodbye. Yeah. I didn't sign on air either. I just signed off and, and walked out. Ted Wallachin returns in a moment. Hey, if you're looking to restock your wardrobe, maybe you should consider my friend Tom Mahalik at Tom's Place. He is the inflation fighter, and right now they've got incredible deals like lips and shirts. I love these shirts. Regularly up to two twenty five. Now only sixty six dollars. Designer suits are regularly up to five ninety nine. Now between one seventy nine and two seventy nine. And if you're looking for a nice sports jacket, valued at up to six ninety five. Well, they're fifty percent off. Tom Spice and Kensington Market. They're located at 190 Baldwin. Check them out. They are the inflation fighters. 
Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387, that's one 309 or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca, that's info at etpcanada.ca. Now back to Ted Wallachan. Gordon Martinos is my guest. What's your take on the Lisa LaFlamme situation? Do you, you know Lisa? I don't know her, I've never spoken to her, uh, but I would have enjoyed the opportunity, but if it, it, makes no sense to me because when you when you look at the situation when you look at the numbers you know the ratings and and how difficult things are for any broadcast institution or print uh, uh, initiative these days then you realize she was the reason people were watching television yeah she looks like the people who watch tv that's right plain and simple why would you play with that why would you cancel that out why would you alienate your, you know, your viewership by doing that? I think it was the, the, a terrible decision. Terrible. Well, because she mirrored the audience. You, you yeah. can't, you can't bring in somebody, and and this has nothing, no, you know, no reflection on Omar Sachedina because he does, he does a great job, and he's and he somewhat younger, but not a lot younger. And, and yeah. it's like, it, do, do they think that he suddenly is going to be attracting twenty-five year olds? Because I got news for you. 25-year-olds don't even watch TV. They watch streaming. They don't listen to radio. They download music. They don't read newspapers. They walk around with, with iPads and, and, and their phones and pick up information. Those days are gone. Yes. You know what's key to this thing, too? And you know this from, from your experience in broadcasting. For example, when you wake up in the morning and you turn on the radio, if your person isn't there on the air, you are subliminally upset. That bothers you. Yeah. So when you take away Lisa LaFlamme and put on it, uh, Omar Sachedina, who worked at City at one time, uh, nice, nice enough guy, but you know, people, you can't get warm to somebody you don't know. And so you're risking a hell of a lot. Omar may turn out to be the best thing they've ever had. I don't know. But I know he's dedicated and he's a good journalist, but you know, there's a bond that happens, a subliminal bond that happens with whomever is on the air be it radio or television. You like that person for a reason. You listen to them or you watch them for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. and when you play with that, when you cancel that out, you're risking the whole game. And and that's what they've done. And the thing is that they don't realize is, is that when you have people such as yourself who spent 39 years working in one position or Wally Crowder, the man that I was fortunate enough to, re to replace, who yeah. was there for, for 50 years, is these people they become family yes you're it's right it's like the people listening to you watching gord martino are thinking i've been watching gord martino for 28 years now or 29 years or 32 years now at this point he might as well be living in my house yeah and you know what that is uh that is uh an incredible honor to yeah to be that way that enormous honor and uh and i'm tearing up a little bit but um I held that very close to my heart for all those years. And uh, when people gave me that kind of uh, respect and, you know, invited me into their homes every evening, um, I, I cherished that. And that was a wonderful thing. That's one of the hardest things to overcome when I left City TV was not being able to be with my people. When was the last time you were at City TV in the building? In the building, I went for... Um, I went to edit some stuff for the Herbie Fund, and I needed special permission to do that uh, because when I left, I didn't ask for anything until I had already left. And then I went, I, I spoke to one of the executives and said, you know, uh, I want to continue my work with the Herbie Fund. I need airtime and a shooter, 
and an editor. And it's not going to cost you anything because they're going to do this for free, and like I do. And so, you know, they, they, they granted me that permission. So I went into the city and saw some of the people. And that was, uh, boy, that was weird. Is, is, is Gord, does Gord Martineau has, have a presence in that building? Possibly. Like, are there no. pictures of you on the walls? No, none, no. None. Right. There are pictures of Mark Daly, Colin Vaughn, you know, people who passed on, um, who were significant contributors to yeah. the success of the news. Uh, but no, there's nothing, nothing that says Gord. <laughs> uh, not that I've noticed anyway. Like, you know, there were things, like, you know, certain awards that had, had been and been made, but um, they disappeared. Dave Agar, with whom I worked at um, at CFRB, and you know Dave, he was our news director for years and years, and he retired, and they named the CFRB newsroom the Dave, D. Dave Agar Newsroom. Right. Uh, fast forward a couple of years later, um, Bell Media decides to go in with their in the Night of the Long Knives and start cutting a swath of um, the path through this newsroom until they eliminated everyone, and the newsroom is now meaningless. And Agar said, give me my plaque. Good for him. Good for him. Yeah. Like it's like it, it, I don't understand. It's like you you take these these organizations that have this huge history, and you start screwing with history, eliminating history, pretending that things didn't happen. You know who's right. infamous for that? The Soviet Union. Yeah, you're right. Yes. And, and to walk in, in into City TV and not see something, not see a poster, a plaque, or whatever with Gord Martineau there, it, it boggles my mind. There, it, there's probably nothing that, that, that shows Moses Neimer either, or, yeah. or Philly uh, Schwartzer for that matter. One of the things that really rankled me, really rankled me, you know the, uh, the live eye that's stuck on the side of the building at 299 Queen West? Yep, with CP24 now. Yeah, and it was City Pulse written on it? Yep. And it was all bashed in because it was bashed in that way when, when they took it out of service. The Bell Media uh, painted over it. And I just thought, you know, you have, I thought Bell Media had basically appropriated CP24. They didn't create it. No. Nope. They didn't change anything about it because why would you fool with perfection? Not perfection, but, you know, with success, you don't fool with success. And... That really bothered me. And that was, uh, I don't know whether you've ever met Steve Bourne. He's a camera supervisor at City. And Can't he's my shooter. Every documentary I've ever done, he, he does them. He's, we're very close. And he drove that vehicle. That was his. Mm. And when he did that, I mean, he was pretty upset, you know. Um, you know, he even tells a story about one night in a snowstorm that, you know, the thing was sliding out of control and collided with a street, with a street car. And the police came and investigated, and they just said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, there's no damage to the streetcar because they were behemoths, you know. Yeah. You couldn't dent one, but the front was pushed in a little bit, and the front is still pushed in if you look closely. But, you know, that was an icon. Moses Snyder put that there for a reason, and I thought it was brilliant. Uh, you know, and to, to, it's almost like they besmirched it by erasing City Pulse and putting CP24 on it. I just thought that was disgusting. Let's talk about your charitable work. And, yep. you, and you've done tons and tons and tons of it. Some of it's closer to your heart uh, th than others. The Herbie Fund. Yep. Probably, would that be your your charity, so to speak? Yeah. yeah. I, you know, it, it happened like I was on air the night the story broke in 1979. So I knew very well about the Herbie Fund and how it got created, which was, so 1978, I think it was, um, a baby is taken to the Brooklyn Medical Center by his, his family, and his esophagus and trachea are conjoined, an extremely rare happenstance, but it, and it made, him, it, made it tr tremendously difficult for him to swallow, so he had a hell of a time trying to eat and basically just swallowing his own saliva. Yeah. So it was a classic story. Sorry, no money, no surgery. See you later. Can you imagine being the parent of that child knowing, and, and he is going to die. 
unless he gets that surgery. So there's a reporter from the Toronto Star, Dale Brazow. You probably know Dale. Yep. I don't know him personally, but I know their name. Yep. He, so he's there in New York and is in conversation with a nurse, and she tells him what's going on with his baby. And he's going, what? You mean America's going to let this child die because his family doesn't have any money? So he comes back, says, follow, phones Paul Godfrey, and says, Paul, you got to do something here. And while that's happening, Paul's wife uh, has read the story in the Star. And she too says, Paul, make an appeal. Do something. You've got to save this kid. So he does. Children are giving up their lunch money. They're walking instead of taking streetcars. Very emotional story. Over $4,000 is collected, which I guess in those days was a lot of money. And the Herbie Fund was begun. In the meantime, New York State is so embarrassed that they agree to pay for the surgery. <laughs> All hitch was there were only two doctors in the world who knew how to perform that surgery. One of them was in Boston and wanted a large amount of money, which was like stratospherical, and there's no way that was going to happen. The other was the guy who actually created or established or you know, knew how to do the surgery, was the first person to do it because he created the procedure. And he, as luck would have it, was working at Sick Kids Hospital. His name was Bob Filler. Bob Filler is one of the nicest human beings you'll ever want to meet. He just passed away about a year and a half ago. But he was a, a sweet human being. He said, I don't want any money. Bring me the kid. So they did. And the kid came up to Herbie. Herbie Quinones was his name. That's his real name. And so uh, he came up to Toronto. And I'll tell you another story when I finish this one. That's really good. Anyway, uh, he came up to Toronto, got the surgery, and went home. You know, And so all this money was left over. And they thought, well, you know, if there's one kid, there's got to be more. So let's start, you know, a sick kids initiative called the Herbie Fund. And it's still there today. Yeah. I was in Ethiopia a couple of years ago doing a Herbie Fund story of a child who was going to die and got surgery. And we found the very intern. He was an intern. He's now a heart surgeon in Ethiopia. But he was the intern on duty the night that the president of the hospital said, you come here, you're going to take this baby and you're going to fly to Toronto and make sure he gets his life-saving surgery. We found that doctor and he's Ethiopian many, so many years later. And just, it just happened that we found him that we were doing a story there. And one of the doctors said, well, he's the original guy who brought the kid to Toronto. So we met him as well, did an interview with him. And uh, he's been on 60 Minutes and wow. kind of international shows. But anyway, that's the Herbie Fund. So the Herbie Fund, since 1979, has saved the lives of over 1,000 children from 110 countries. That's amazing. And continue to do so, yeah. That's amazing. And now you recently spent some time in Ukraine, war-torn Ukraine, as the war ravages on between, well, it's not even between anybody. It's just an attack on one country from another country. Uh, with, with Global Medic. Tell me about that and your experience there. Yeah, well, I, I'm a volunteer member of the, uh, on, on the board of Global Medic, and it was begun by a guy named Raul Singh, who was a Toronto paramedic. I did a story on him uh, in 2002. I used to have this series called The Livable City. Mm -hmm. People who were doing things that made the city a better place or did something you know better for society in general and who were Torontonians. So I did an interview with him one day. He explained what he was doing. He would hold uh, T-shirt sales, barbecues, and save up any donations that were made until he had $7,500. And then he would book a shipping container and send medical supplies over to a third world country. Those medical supplies were beds, gurneys, um, things that had been taken out of service and were in a warehouse or a landfill site. And if they were in a warehouse, they were going to end up in a landfill. Right. And so he this is ridiculous. Somebody can use this stuff. And so he started this fund. And it was named after his best friend, uh, David McAntony. David McAntony Gibson, I think was his name. And so he started and, and then changed the name to Global Medic. But um, he said to me, hey, we're going to Cambodia. You should come with us and do a story on us. <laughs> and I said, yeah, sure. I'll just drop everything and, and run over to Cambodia. I had a pretty ridiculous idea. But then when I thought about it, He's using Toronto police officers, he's using EMS technicians, and Toronto firefighters um, as volunteers to distribute 
the medical gear that he's collected. Mm -hmm. I thought, a great story about Toronto. So I said, I kind of got a little egotistical about it. I went into the news director and said, I'm doing this story. And he said, great. So I went to Cambodia and it was a great story. And, and I saw the effect it was having on the medical system there, which was, you know, in tatters after the revolution that had happened there in the Civil War. Uh, anyway, he, uh, you know, he continued his work with, with uh, the Global Medic. And he said to me one day, would you like to be on the board? I said, yeah, why not? Yep. And so I've deployed with them 11 times. I've uh, gone to all kinds of different disaster zones around the world. In the case of Ukraine, he said to me, you, you can go over and, you know, inspect our uh, food distribution programs for the refugees and tell me, you know, what's happening, your opinion of it. And so I did. And what an impact that had. I flew to uh, Frankfurt, Germany, and then to uh, Kizanau, Moldova, and then by land into Ukraine. I stayed in Moldova for a few days as well, looking at refugee supplies there, because it borders Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there are, you know, this, the countries that border Ukraine are incredible. I mean, there, there's so many of them. And, you know, Poland, Romania, uh, Hungary. Belarus. You know, they all, yeah. So I went into Odessa and just fell in love with the place. I love Odessa. I would go back there in a heartbeat. It's, it's got wonderful European architecture, you know, the, the classic stuff. And the attitude of the people there is so warm and friendly. People are just wonderful to, to be with and so creative. And I just thought, wow, and Putin's trying to destroy the place. How dare he? How dare he? Once this invasion is over with, and hopefully Ukraine walks away a free nation with all its property back in its, in its possession, they're going to need people like you to go to places like Odessa to help rebuild it via tourism industry, etc. Uh, because yeah. there, there are so that's a country that has so much to offer and oh. is being persecuted for no reason. We don't attack. When I say we, it's my family comes from Ukraine. The Ukrainians yeah. aren't attacking anybody. They're being attacked by Russia because of this 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 dictator who wants who wants the Soviet Union to re-exist. Well, look how many uh, immigrants from Ukraine live in our great country. Uh, wonderful people, hardworking folks, created a life for themselves, contributed so much to this country, and that son of a bitch goes in there unprovoked, murdering women and children, yeah. bombing schools and daycare centers. I know that is absolutely. Well, I'm speechless <laughs> in describing my, my opposition to what he's done and why one of his followers hasn't, you know, removed him from office is yeah. astounding. I know he's kind of, you know, uh, and this this is going to sound way too flippant, flippant but I'm going to say it anyway. What the hell? It's kind of like he's he's trying to do to Ukraine what, what corporations are doing to the media in this country. Well, he's trying to do to Ukraine what you mentioned earlier. What the Soviet Union did, erase people's thoughts and culture. Yeah. He's trying to erase it, and in the process, erase erase as many Ukrainians as he can. Yeah. That's outrageous. And you know, the 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 nicest, warmest, most intelligent people you'll ever meet. And you know, the 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 fact that he's trying to destroy that is, I mean, the instant reaction is, well, why don't they drop the big one on Moscow? Well, then you're going to kill a bunch of innocent people. You can't do that. Yeah, I know. But that's that's your knee-jerk reaction. But you know, uh, and also the people in Moldova, another group of wonderful people who have taken in uh, a large majority of the 7.3 million Ukrainians who fled that country at the outset of the invasion. It's still counting. Most have moved on, but Moldova is one of the poorest countries in Europe, and yet it opens its doors yeah. to these people. And, and a very welcoming fashion, and they should be congratulated. I mean, there's so many stories that that I, that I picked up over there. I mean, I was handing out breakfast one morning to a, a, a huge lineup of refugees in Odessa one morning, and a woman was next in line. She came over, and I gave handed her the box with, with all the food in it. And you know, when you meet somebody and you look at them and you look them in the eyes and you know what's going on right away. You know, they're disturbed about something. Mm -hmm. She started crying and she was well dressed, had makeup on. And this was not going to destroy her, but it was hurting her in such a way that she burst out crying 
I handed her a box of, of, of food. She just looked down at it, put her head down, and walked away. I patted her on the shoulder. Well, what are you, you going to do? I mean, you know, there, there were 2,000 people waiting there for, for their food. But um, I was really moved by that. And also, the story of a woman in Moldova who is walking down the street one day. She sees this woman crying, and she has two children with her. And she said, what's wrong? And the woman says, well, I have nowhere to go. Well, why? I'm a, I'm a refugee from Ukraine. And the woman said, well, now you have a home. Come with me. Yeah. Took her home. You know, um, that's very emotional stuff. It is. Do the quality of the people you're dealing with. And uh, they have nothing, but they're ready to share. It's ironic, it's think- ironic when, you, when you witness that because you think to yourself, it's the worst in people bring out the best in other people. Yeah. You know, and I think that the Ukrainians, uh, God bless them all, and Moldovans, um, I think they can, wh- why they're so ready to help is because they've been there. They were under the thumb of communist rule and they were under, they were being oppressed. And so, and they had not a lot to begin with. So I think they could relate to that headspace of being in that position. Yeah. And that's why they were so instantaneously welcoming and, uh, and, and just uh, an incredible group of people that I met there. You yeah. know? And, we, uh, Global Medic, is supporting um, a number of, of uh, distribution centers. They set up, I think, five in Kizanau and in, in Moldova. And these they contain fresh fruit and vegetables whenever they can and the staples that people need. So 2,000 families a week show up there at, at these centers. And, you know, the, the, the gratitude on the part of these people is, is enormous. You know, they, they try to speak English, say thank you and, and you know, hello and, you know, and I, where are you from? Canada. Oh, Global Medic. Yeah, I love Global Medic, you know. Uh, so it, that was a, a very solid experience. The same thing in Moldova and the same thing in Ukraine. And what, you know what, another thing that kind of surprised me is that in this country, we have a tough time getting people to speak two languages. Well, in Ukraine, everyone, and I mean everyone speaks Ukrainian, Russian, Moldovan, and Romanian. And they turn on a dime. <laughs> and the, young, the younger one's English. Well, they, yeah, right. And, and yes, now they're all speaking English and because it's been instituted in the school system there. And, and you compare that to our resistance to speaking two languages. It's, it's ridiculous because Ukrainians regard it as an asset. Yeah. And, which it is, of course. Gord Martin, who is my guest, let, let, let me ask you your question, a question here. Some, if you're approached by a, a young student in college or high school who says to you, Mr. Martin, no, I, I would really like to pursue a career in broadcasting, what would you suggest to them? You'd have to temper them with the reality of the current situation. Yeah. Is that the internet has murdered everything. Um, th- that there's not enough creativity in broadcasting, which would help it, I think, enormously, because the people who control broadcasting are bean counters who have no soul. <laughs> they don't care. They just don't care. If it costs more than five dollars, we're not doing it. That's the attitude. Yeah. And they look at the bottom line. And yeah, sure, there there are losses that are incurred. But if you do things right, you know, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. If you you know, if you do it right, people will watch and the advertisers will follow. Yeah. But if you make the effort and if you resign yourself to the fact that you're basically, you, you've got a sign on the building that says going out of business, then that's the attitude the advertisers are going to have. You know, and that's the attitude that, that potential listeners, viewers and readers will have. Yeah. You know, you've got to make an effort and, and it can be done. City proved that in the early days, proved that they could change people's viewing habits by the hundreds of thousands and millions, and they did it. So it can be done. So there is hope for people who, who aspire to work in, in, in the media. I would suggest that one of the things that people should be aware of and should, but should be prepared to do is virtually everything. So yes. get ready to read the news, get ready to read the sports, get ready to research, get ready to be a, a chase producer, get ready to be a host, get ready to do everything. Gord Martino, thanks very much. It's been a real pleasure as usual. Thank you very much, Ted, for having me on. All the best to you. 
The Ted Walsh and Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's, the meat people. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.